All right, hey everybody. Today uh, I have an interview with Gabriel Sprock here. He's another, um, or he's another Christian YouTuber. Um, he has a, a small channel just like mine, um, but he also does some pretty um, interesting videos, like I would say I do as well, on some um, topics that are very similar to me. He touches on, you know, uh, religious stuff. He touches on um, politics as well as some historical topics as well. Um, there's a lot of overlap between our channels, I would say. And so I saw his stuff. And I want to do an interview with him. So uh, Gabriel, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. So I specifically want to talk to you because you've done a lot of work with regards to um, the French philosopher René Guénon and his sort of um, branch, well, what we might call like, you know, perennialism. Um, and I kind of really just want to talk about that today, or at least start our conversation talking about René Guénon and some of his views, and especially viewing them from a more, um, you know, viewing him from like a Christian lens, but also some from somebody, you know, who has our sort of like, I guess, politics, you could say, or political worldview, and sort of evaluating uh, some of his critiques and what he has to say. So could you tell us a little bit, a little bit about who René Guénon was? And Yeah, so René Guénon was a, uh, he was a French philosopher and um, he was pretty active from the 20s all the way up, I believe he died in 1955 or 1953, somewhere around there. He, uh, he first started off, he went to college for mathematics and physics, but uh, he always had an interest in esotericism specifically Gnosticism and Hinduism in his early, uh, his early writings. They really focus on that. But he's, he's mostly known for two books, uh, Crisis of the Modern World, which is a shorter book, and his like, magnum opus, uh, The Reign of Quantity and The Signs of the Times. And I guess you could kind of view him as the founder of perennialism in a way. Um, he wasn't as explicit a perennialist as someone like... Um, Fritz Joff Schuon or Martin Lings, who really, I guess, formulated the theory more coherently and more concretely. Uh, Guanon just, uh, he kind of laid the groundwork for, for that to happen. And his arguments are, well, they're interesting because they're, they're very unique from what I've seen. For example, I think, I think the best way to understand his work is to really focus on his book, The Reign of Quantity and the Signs of the Times, because through that book, he, um, it's kind of like it's like the best hits of going on encapsulated in a book and it's really i think he was trying to um portray his message or his his purpose or his goal of writing through that book so usually um the book kind of starts out and i'm not going to go through the whole book because it's it's a lot to go through but um the main crux of the book is that he uh um he wants to critique contemporary philosophy well he wants to critique the contemporary world and he first starts out by critiquing presuppositions that are latent within contemporary philosophy so the first you know a couple chapters of that book go into um his critique of descartes and his uh his critique of um his uh artesian understandings of materialism and uh even notions that led it that are prevalent in modern physics so and he the way he critiques is that he contrasts it with a more aristotelian and platonic view of things like matter and form and essence he divides the world into an essential pole and a substantial pole and what he means by that now this is tricky because aristotle kind of has this in reverse but what Guanon means by this is there's the world of essence and then there's the world of um substance and he, he's kind of referencing Aristotle's uh, prima materia, like this sort of like formless, formlessness that you can't really, you know, a, as soon as you try to identify it, you, you um, how should I say this, you kind of give it an essence and then it, it loses the very notion of its formlessness because now, now it has a, uh, an identity. As soon as you identify it, you give it like this essence. So he just kind of goes into like... Um, he slowly critiques the metaphysical presuppositions of modernity, and then through that, he try and reorients your thinking um, by contrasting it with more perennial thought, which I really think, when, if you understand Aristotle and, and you read Gwen on, then it, you kind of see they're very, very similar. It's like a combination of Aristotle and Plato, I would say. And then he also references there's a, an equivalent in Hinduism, so... Yeah, I, I have read um, Crisis of the Modern World, which is, um, I don't know if he wrote that before or after The Reign of Quantity, um, but from what I understand, it's a much more accessible book. I mean, it reads very, it's a lot, it's very short. I mean, it's something like less than 200 pages. 
and it reads very it's very easy to read so how, how does um with regards to it because i know he has a lot of like you know critiques i guess you could say of like the modern the western world but what do you think he is um with regards to building his own sort of philosophy or philosophical system or whatever he would call it where do you think his like major i guess contributions to the to philosophy stand and not just his merely not just his critiques uh so this is interesting my my favorite book um written by going and i have a video about this on my channel it's i don't I think I do reference Gwinnon in it, but I kind of I expanded on his arguments. He Gwinnon wrote this book called uh, "The Metaphysical Principles of the Infinitesimal Calculus." Now that's a really autistic title, but the book is very it's it's very good because he critiques a bunch of notions of mathematics. He you know he he uh, contrasts um, the difference between infinity and indefinitude. Uh, he kind of argues against the existence of the number zero. It's almost when you read that book, it's almost like you're reading like um, like analytic philosophy in a way. And I think like that is a very unique something unique about him. And he starts referencing thinkers like Leibniz, and um, he com- and where he's deriving this idea from is, uh, I guess, back again. He's he's referencing Platonic Platonic texts, um, Platonic ideas. Um, from antiquity, and he's kind of showing, well, you know, these ideas are superior to more modern notions, which kind of um, are less rigorous. That was a term that he used. So I think that his, his work on mathematics is um, a very unique work that I highly recommend anyone check out. A lot of people say, oh, I'm not good at math. Like, you don't have to be good at math. As long as you understand the basics, you can understand what he's talking about, really. Um, so that's one, like, like his pure metaphysics, I think is very unique and interesting. Um, in terms of like his more social critiques, well, we we want to expand away from the critiques, right? But um, I think he's trying to build this idea that, and this basically comes down, back down to perennialism, that all the world religions, um, they are expressions of one fundamental truth. That if you follow each path, so whether it be Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, whatever, uh, if you follow that path strictly, you will end up leading yourself to the same place. You could symbolically, and I believe he used this um, symbolism, or maybe someone else did. Um, you could view it as like a mountain with a peak, obviously, with many paths coming down the mountain. Those different paths represent um, different religions, but they all lead to the same climax, to the same peak. So that's kind of his view when it comes to religion. And basically, he, he um, but again, you know, I do think he, he, is not really I think he says he believes that, but at the same time I think he leans more into more pagan thought because he does believe in cyclical time. He does believe in like the golden age, the you know, the Kali Yuga and all like he thinks those are real. Um he probably thinks you could interpret that through Christianity and there's Christian um similarities, but you know, that that's a whole nother debate. But um but yeah, so he's kind of this um platonic perennialist, I would say, because underneath all that truth is you know, this Platonic God, but for Guanan, it's he expresses himself through the world religions to different people. So uh, different people have different um, experiences of the world, and God caters to each experience according to Guanan. So I think that's really like if you want to really hone in on what Guanan truly believes, um, that would be it. I just find it a bit um, hard to accept the thesis that, you know, all these religions are kind of pointing at the same thing. You know, I believe that there is kind of one spiritual world, which we all encounter, you know, of course we all experience it their own like subjective lens. And I think all, you know, religions, they do have some similarities to them. Like, you know, you can look at all these religions who never touch each other, you know, have like similar flood narratives, you know, similar things about, you know, uh, demons and, um, you know, other spiritual beings, et cetera, et cetera. However, you know, when it comes to something like, you know, Christianity versus like, you know, some pagan religion, uh, they just seem so different to me. I mean, I don't, I don't know how one yes. like him can seriously, you know, take the idea that oh, this religion says that you know Jesus Christ is like the Son of God and he was who came to you know save the world from all this stuff. Um, and then these people are just like worshiping these um, you know, low level you know demons. How can those be hitting hitting at the same thing in any in any meaningful way? Like I don't get how guys right. so and, smart you know, as him kind of believe some of this stuff. And you you make a very good point because. So just for a little background about myself real quick, just because it's, it's relevant here, yeah. I promise. Um, when I first got into it, went on, um, I, I just found, like, I actually discovered him through, like, right-wing memes. And I was like, you know, 
you know, I don't think the people who are making these memes know much about him, or maybe they've read a couple articles here and there, and like, you know, they never actually like really delved into delved into his work. So then that that sparked an interest in me, and I said, okay, I'll start an Instagram page because I had a friend who had a Instagram page called Evola Posting. He got banned, and I said, okay, I'll start going on posting, and then I built up a following from there. And then as I started learning more and more about him, um, I kind of realized that a lot of his ideas. Well, not a lot of his ideas, but like that one, his main idea of perennialism just seemed. Actually, there's a, I believe there's a fallacy called like the quantifier shift fallacy or like the parts of the whole fallacy, which Gwanon is engaging in here. You know, he's, he's only focusing on the similarities between religion and ignoring the differences. Like, well, why should the differences be ignored? He never explains that. He says, oh, there are, you know. They're rudimentary, they're just kind of service level, but no, not really, because if you look at the theology of Islam and like their metaphysical understanding of God versus a Trinitarian understanding of God, like that's not superficial. That, that, that affects everything else um, in the whole metaphysical system you have in each religion. So I don't think you could just ignore um, certain aspects of the religion and think that it doesn't matter, because even the smallest things in uh in a religious system, metaphysically speaking, can have large effects. You know, a lot of Christians, um, they, they know what the Trinity is, but they don't know what it actually entails and why it's there. And like, you know, my friend Trey, he's, you know, he's wor working on a massive project where he talks about that and how it, it really matters. And, you know, there's a lot of Orthodox philosophers who talk about, you know, the world being modeled after the Trinity. There's Trinitarian patterns in the world. But then in Islam, you know, you don't have that. God is a pure unity in Islam and, you know, that that can lead to a whole bunch of metaphysical hiccups where, you know, if God doesn't have um, multiplicity within himself, how can he give multiplicity to the world? You can't give something to, to something else if you don't have it first. So Yeah, also Islam, they're very yeah. hardcore, like, occasionalists. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the, I guess the only, like, what what would be the equivalent in Christianity? Like, Calvinism is something similar to yeah, that? Yeah, with, maybe. like, Melon Branch um, and some other people. Yeah. Or if you if you've read of Carl Schmidt, uh, political romanticism, he actually calls the whole entire um, romantic movement nothing but a secularized um, occasionalism. Interestingly enough, yeah, I, I I've only read two works by Schmidt. I'm still I'm still um, going through his stuff, but I, I very I love his writing. And uh, yeah, and yeah. I don't know if you've read there's this there's this some um, interview that I read. Um, I follow this on on Substack. I follow this like um this like account that like translates these like um kind of interwar um, Romanian writings into English and or kind of a Romanian figures. So a lot of it's actually from French because, you know, they spoke French. Um, some of them did or to write into a broader, broader, broader audience. And one of them is from uh, Mircea Eliada, who are you familiar with him at all? Yes, I am. Yeah. So it's this interview with Mircea Eliada and Carl Schmidt. And in it, um, this is like in the 19, somewhere in the 1930s, uh, uh, Schmidt says, according to that interview, Schmidt says that René Gagnon is the most interesting man in Europe at this moment. That is interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, you know, I, don't, I couldn't find anything where you wrote about him, but it, it is kind of interesting. So let's transition to, um, you know, we kind of, I, th I think a lot of my viewers and a lot of your viewers, I, I, would, I would think too, kind of know the general kind of gist of perennialism. And you kind of uh, t told some sort of interesting insights that Gagnon has, but I want to now kind of shift to more of what we might call his critiques of the modern world, um, the Western world, or kind of the um, the world at large, we might say, um, from his viewpoint, because I think that in a lot of ways is where he's most valuable um, for us. Because a lot of his perennialism, you know, it gets kind of silly saying all these religions are the same, even though there's very stark contradictions. I mean, you know, it's not just like you know, oh, we you know do we do a hand sign this way, you do a hand sign this way. It's like no, that you know, our gods say completely contradictory things. Um, so maybe we can go into some of his critiques that he has in the modern world from a very spiritual worldview. Because I think even though he, you know, wasn't an explicit Christian, he still has more or less the Christian understanding of the spiritual world, at least in a way that a lot of people at his time didn't have, you know, in the sort of, um, you know, the early 20th, early mid 20th century, you know, very materialistic times. Um, so maybe we can go into some of the critiques that, uh, that Ganon has of the modern world. Yeah. So interestingly enough, um, Gwinnon has this idea, well, he's got, all of his critiques of the modern world stem from his critique of people's metaphysical understandings of the world, and we'll just call it what it is, it was mostly materialism, and he critiques 
like he, he kind of goes through the effects of what this like epistemology and basically metaphysical belief in materialism has on people. One of his ideas, um, he talks about art, for example, and um, he, he talks about uh, he, he divides the world into two. He, he bifurcates it into quantitative thinking and qualitative thinking. Uh, quantitative thinking is thinking of the world in basically numerics, um, matter. You know, ba- like basically just think about it as um, materialism and and math. Like those are the only two things that are really um, that are real for, for these for contemporary thinking. Uh, they only believe in the existence of um, substance, right, and not essence. Which that would be qualitative thinking. So qualitative thinking would include um, things such as like God, um, e- even like abstract metaphysical forms, like Platonic forms. Um, even like th- like things like math would have a qualitative aspect and a quantitative aspect. Now Guanan says math is this. Um, it's a it's a field of pure quantity. But then at the same time he says um, there's, you can't have pure quantity. And you can't have pure quality. Like, they kind of necessitate each other. Um, which leads mm-hmm. me to believe that he believed in eternal creation, in my opinion. But, and that would make sense given his view of time. But, uh, so from there, he kind of talks about, like I was saying, art. Where he goes into this idea of um, anonymity in art. So, during, you know, more religious times within Europe and around the world, art was, you know everywhere but the people who made the art remained anonymous and the reason they remained anonymous was because the art wasn't really meant to reflect them even though the act of doing it for them was a spiritual experience and it was like a form of piety in a way because they were they were doing giving a service to god in the church for example uh but they remained anonymous because it's something beyond them it, it transcends their ego but now in contemporary times you have an inverted version of this where um you know, people want to, um, artists want to be known for themselves, um, and they want to have, like, a, an ego attached to their work. But then, paradoxically, at the same time, craftsmen, um, people who do all, you know, basically engage in aesthetics for a living, um, they end up being anonymous because the the work that they're doing is so, it lacks any spiritual transcendence that it ends up all being the same and you could just replace the person doing it and it wouldn't make a difference because no soul went into it nothing um nothing actually uh i guess you could say transcendental nothing actually sanctifying happened when these people were making the art so he kind of talks about how like uh in modern society you have this you have similar things going on but it's inverted another example he gives is um let me let me try and remember here he talks about, oh yeah, well, solidification is this other idea he has where um, the more you believe in materialism, the more you act as if materialism is true, phenomenologically speaking, it becomes true. And what he means by that is, and, and there's a Christian understanding of this that I came to learn a lot later on when I immersed myself in Christian theology is when you harden your heart toward God, you isolate yourself toward God, and it you almost it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way you almost make it seem as if god isn't real because you're so um distant from god you kind of lock yourself away from him and it's like this vicious cycle so Guanan says you know when humanity does this um on a whole you uh you, you actually kind of create what you what you think is real you distance yourself from god god stops communicating with you because you don't let him into your life or let him into your soul or whatever, and it seems like he's not there. And then the world, um, you know, he, he starts, like, making symbolic references to, like, the the um, mineralization of, like, wood in a forest when a tree falls down or whatever. And he talks about how, yeah, like, the world becomes more and more materialistic, and it literally slows down because of this way of thinking. And people start to mechanize the world more. In one of the chapters, I believe in Crisis of the Modern World, he talks about how it used to be a lot easier to be a nomad because you didn't have to go through all these, like, um, checkpoints because society didn't really w- wasn't so um, mechanized. It, it, it's interesting because a lot of his work, it's, he's almost like um, 
he's not Ted Kaczynski, but he is critiquing technology from a from a really esoteric and spiritual point of view. So um, those are just some of the ideas, and I think the solidification one is a really you can really understand it in a Christian way, like the hard, hardening your heart toward God is a good example of that. Um, what else are some other things he talks about? Well, um, he talks about this idea of the ordinary life. This is another one that I always like to point out. So people have this idea, and we actually, it's very popular now with like the new atheist movement that, uh, you know, the idea of God and the idea of angels and really anything out of this world that we live in is not ordinary. It's extraordinary, if you will. And uh, Gwanan says that's actually inverted. Like the mundane world that we live in is actually not is, is actually the extraordinary world because the the world that's been there eternally is the primordial world that's been there for all of eternity. That's the ordinary world because it's always existed. It's the fundamental existence. The world we live in now is contingent and finite and can be withered away within any moment. This is actually more of a miracle than the primordial world, which is like the basis for anything else that exists. So those are just like some of the, I think like the most important ideas that he's espoused. And I think you could definitely understand that in a Christian way if you want to. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously you have to maybe um, change some of this talk about the eternal world, you know, maybe switch some of that stuff around, you know, make sure that's fully Christian. But yeah, I think the idea of that critique is still very powerful. Yeah, and uh, there's another, like, he goes, like, there's, if I can remember correctly, it's like chapter by chapter, he starts contrasting these inverted ideas. He talks about this idea of unification. This is another interesting one. Um, now this, I guess, now that I've, like, matured in my, like, philosophical understanding of things, I guess I can see where like his like Neoplatonism is really coming through here. So he talks about um, quantitative and qualitative unification. So quantitative unification. Now, if the audience will remember, a quantitative is quantitative thinking is thinking in terms of pure substance, um, matter for uh, matter without form, um, basically complete lack of transcendence. And this quantitative idea of unification is basically. Um, you, you can kind of picture it as like a dystopian uh, materialistic society where, you know, th there's complete uniformity between all individuals, uh, almost like everybody's like a robot or whatever. And going on talks about how the modern world basically strips everybody of uh, individual identity in the name of materialism. Whereas the true version of that and the more and the proper version of that would be. Um, a unification, a spiritual unification of all of creation with God, um, becoming one with God, and we lose our identity in God or whatever. So that that's like the inverted, the, the quantitative version that is the in, inverted version of the qualitative one, which I just mentioned. So yeah, I guess th that's kind of like the holistic sort of view he's giving after he critiques these kind of um, more Western. I guess he would say he would say they're like they're degenerated forms of perennial thought in the modern world. Yeah, because from what I recall, he does actually praise like um, more traditional forms of Christianity that he sees with like Catholicism and maybe Orthodoxy. I don't know if he really spoke about Orthodoxy or not. I imagine he did, but I know in Christ of the Modern World, he does say that he wished Europe went back to a more sort of like medieval, um, Middle Ages, sort of ancient form of Christianity rather than like, you know, the what, whatever, you know, modern Christianity most of Europe. Or to the extent that Europe was Christian at all, a lot of those people were very... Um, this sort of like very Protestant Western liberal Christianity. Yeah, he critiques he critiques Protestantism as like a, um, yeah, like like a he critiques it in the same way you would say something is like a a bad like mutation of another thing, which is a good way to think of it because it's it's an offshoot of Catholicism and it's got like all these it, it's inverts a lot of ideas that's that's in traditional Christianity. Yeah, I don't know if he spoke about orthodoxy. I I haven't seen him speak about orthodoxy i know his um friend shuan has spoken about orthodoxy before um and he said it's he spoke highly of it he said it's like the highest form of christianity that exists today um and i know going on said he uh i think he was inclined toward catholicism but he had and i don't know the, i don't know the details of the critique it's been a while but he had like some critiques of thomism and he preferred more eastern like metaphysics to that 
and then, and then he ended up converting to Islam because um, he saw Islam as like a halfway point between the East and the West. And I guess maybe he's like literally pinpointing that to geography in a sense. But at the same time, I guess like that affects the religious, whatever, um, the religious manifestation in his view. So another thinker um, who is related in some sense, you could say, to Ganon is Evola. And I know Evola, uh, Julius Evola, who we're talking about, the It- the Italian um, philosopher, who's a bit, I guess he's like a, what, like kind of like the generation after Ganon. He's a little bit younger um, than Ganon, but like they were still, uh, you know, contemporaries at one point. Um, yeah. And he actually has a favorable, even though he kind of has this weird sort of like pagan perennialism, he actually speaks highly favorably of orthodoxy. He says it's like the best form of Christianity. Um, even though he does really critique Catholicism and Protestantism, he does say that um, uh, orthodoxy is sort of the best expression of Christianity, which is interesting. Um, but let's go a little bit into um, Evola, who's a sort of, um, uh, we were talking about this earlier, but he's a little bit of a uh, unorthodox uh, student of Ganon. They never had a really any official contact. I know that Evola sent him some letters, Ganon some letters, but I don't think uh, Ganon ever responded to them or maybe he never got them. Or whatever. Yeah. But Evola uh, did look up highly to Ganon, and maybe you can explain a little bit more. Yeah, about the letters. I have the letters posted on my Instagram page if anyone wants to read them. I don't think, yeah, I think you're right. I don't think Ganon ever responded. But, um, Evola's interesting. Evola is more, he's definitely more pagan than Ganon, I would say. And Ganon was probably, yeah, he was more friendly to all the world religions. I know Evola has this book called. Uh, pagan imperialism. I haven't read it, but from what I've heard, it has something to do with you know um, the destruction of paganism within Europe by Christianity and how this was bad. I might be wrong about that, for the record, but this is what I heard it was about. Um, Evola, he's you know the two very good books by Evola that I that I have read is Revolt Against the Modern World and The Metaphysics of War. Um, they were you know he, he's a very interesting writer and. And he's entertaining to read, but um, yeah, Evola. I love all the little like uh, I love when, when you read him. He goes into all these little like rabbit holes and tangents. Like, what does this have to do? Like, this is interesting, but what does this have to do with the point that you were just making? Like, I remember I read um, for instance, like the, the metaphysics of sex, I believe, and he's talking about like um the different like you know the genders and sex and this stuff, and then all of a sudden he says like, oh by the way, I don't believe in evolution. Uh, I just believe and um, I don't believe in evolution. I believe in de-evolution. Man doesn't come from apes. Apes come from man. Okay, back to talking about sex. <laughs> yeah, he's really like all over the place with his writing, and it's it's kind of funny. Like, um, he uh, like when I was reading Revolt Against the Modern World, like there's points in that book where he like will refuse to translate a word. So if there's a word in Greek, he's just gonna leave it there in the Greek script, and you're just not gonna know what it is unless you, you know, take a picture of it and then Google it. When, you know, like, he, he just doesn't care to translate, which I thought was really funny um evola has he he believes more in like the cyclical view of time and that's why he has this idea of ride the tiger where like you know there's really nothing we can do about the modern world except just wait it out basically um and it's like it's going to be like a spiritual thing interesting things i remember from revolt against the modern world was his critique of communism and capitalism I mean, it's not that unique to be honest, but he just—he's got a similar like. I, I, it very—it seems very Gwinonian in the sense that he calls them both like materialistic views. Like he says something along the lines of like, uh, "It doesn't matter who wins the Cold War because you're just going to end up with the same like materialistic society in the end." Uh, I, I believe he did say something similar to the line, uh, "You know, communism rots uh, the body and liberalism rots the soul," something like that. Um, I don't know if he said that verbatim, but I'm pretty sure he did say something along those lines. Sure. Uh, the Metaphysics of War. I, I really do like that book. That, that's probably my favorite book by him that I've read. I like this idea that um, war can bring out – it can help you mature in a certain way. And um, now he also critiques modern warfare – so does going on, and their critiques are both very similar. He talks about this idea that, you know, modern warfare with its high mechanization is more destructive, that's obvious, but it's also, it, it lacks, it, it leaves a lack of ability for heroism because you can't really, you don't have like an opportunity to actually like face an opponent one on one like you used to if you're fighting with swords or whatever. He talks about this idea 
which I believe he gets from, well, he does get this from Islam, uh, because he references the word jihad. Um, Well, there's also Christian jihad, but he talks about this idea of, you know, the inner jihad and the outer jihad, like, you go into war, and you're actually fighting two wars. You're fighting a war within yourself to crush the fear of dying, and you're also fighting the actual physical war. And if you're able to crush the war within yourself, you end up, um, let's say you die on the battlefield or whatever, you know, you're going to end up going to paradise because you were able to conquer your own soul. And if you went on the, if you went on earth then you went on earth, but an, an interesting idea that he goes into is this idea of like these pagan religions had less of an emphasis on, uh, the uniqueness of a person's soul. And they're like, you, you, like, if, I guess what he's trying to say is like, when you die in, in this paganistic sort of worldview, you just end up emerging back into oneness. You kind of lose your identity. Um, and that, that's kind of the route he takes with the afterlife. From what I remember, he talks about how sports are, you know, modern sports are like a degeneration of heroism. And uh, they kind of just turn, basically it's like a, it's like a massive law for being a real hero, according to him. And he references like Aztec uh, sports, where uh, I'm sure everybody knows this. I don't know the name of the sport, but it's that it's that game, the Aztecs, or I'm, I don't know if it was the Aztecs. Oh, but I'm with pretty the sure. head. Yeah, or with or like yeah, where they, they they throw like a ball through like a like a stone hoop, and whoever wins actually ends up getting sacrificed. So the, that creates an incentive to lose, I guess. Uh, but uh, no, but I thought being sacrificed is like a good thing, though. Like if you yeah. like that's your reward, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, for them, you know, getting your heart ripped out in front of a thousand people is like that. that that's an honor. So he, he he talks about how like yeah, you, like modern sports is just a total like degradation of like real heroism and real like you know ritualism. Um, he does reference. I, he does literally believe in the hyperborean stuff. Um, I, I do think in one part of the book he talks about how like. Uh, People from, I don't know, he, he tries to make like the really like ramshackle anthropological argument uh, about how like, oh, uh, there's like really big bones in Antarctica that we can't identify. <laughs> and these might be like ancient Aryans or something. And he just says that out of nowhere, like he does with evolution. Um, Source, that's what trust me, bro. Yeah, it's, it's really what it comes down to. It's like, um, see, Evola. He's, in a way, he's kind of post. I hate to say this, but like, he argues like a postmodernist would argue in the sense that if you try to like say, well, you know, what's your justification for this? He'd be like, justification is a modern concept, and I reject it. Like that's something he would do. Um, and, that sounds uh, like him. Yeah, yeah. Like I do believe he literally said at one point um, something along those lines. Like he's just like, yeah, I don't need to prove anything to anybody. Like you either take what I say to be true or you don't. Those who believe it are beyond, um, I, I don't know. Well, he also says, and this is very much like Nietzsche, I guess, in a way. Um, Nietzsche says he's writing for like a specific kind of person, and Evola says the same thing, but the difference is that Nietzsche's person is very man oriented and um, self relating, whereas Evola's is more spiritual or whatever. So I want to transition now to talking about Alexander Dugan, who you and I both know quite a bit about. Uh, you, I was actually really surprised. You actually interviewed Dugan on your channel, which is a you know good job. That's a that's a crazy that's a crazy interview that you did. Good, good job on getting that one, um, because Dugan has a real connection to Ganon and Evola in the sense that back in I want to say it was back in the '90s or maybe the 2000s, probably the 2000s. Sometimes Dugan actually went to Italy and he learned Italian. And just to translate for some, um, one of these kind of like a um, new right or sort of like right wing, um, like we'll say let's say new right kind of like Italian publishing companies, um, they wanted to translate Dugan into Russian. And he did it for them, and he had to learn Italian because you know uh, Evola writes in Italian, so Dugan learned Italian, and then I, th I think he translated Revolt Against the Modern World from Italian into Russian, um, and he also Dugan's also cited Ganon in some of his works as well. And Dugan, uh, Dugan is, you know, he has a very, uh, you know, weird relationship with religion. You know, back in the, uh, like the eighties or nineties, or I think eighties, he was part of this like, um, weird, like, like SS, 
black magic thing. I forget what it was called. It was, it was some really kind of a cringe sort of name, like Order of the SS, like Wizard or something like that. And then right. he kind of be, went on this, and that was kind of like Satanist and stuff like that. But then sometime in the, uh, I think, 2000s, he became a sort of um, schismatic old believer in the Russian Orthodox Church. And then now, um, I think sometime in the 2010s, maybe, he became a... Um, He's still an old believer, but he became a you know in communion old believer, um, and I think now I saw something that he's actually a reader in the Orthodox Church. So you know Dugan is Orthodox, but he does this weird. He does have this sort of weird view of like a soft perennialism. I'll call it where it's sort of like instead of saying all these religions have like you know are all getting at the same truth, he says uh, all these religions which are you know anti materialist, which are you know are somewhat traditional in some sense of the word. They are anti-Western. And because his whole thing is sort of about being against the West, which he views as this monolith that just needs to be destroyed, he is very tolerable and he like uh, you know promotes people and supports people going into these other um, religions that aren't Christianity as long as they're quote-unquote traditional as a sort of... Um, I mean, I guess one way to look at it is you could say that he does it from a pragmatic point of view, but sometimes the way he says it, it seems a little bit more than just pragmatism. It seems like he does kind of actually does kind of edge towards that more actual perennialist, you know, Ganon style view of religion. Yeah. When I spoke to him on my interview two, two and a half years ago now, he, uh, he did, he, I feel like he did, cause we did talk about Gwenon and Evola. He did kind of talk about like, you know, um, the unity of all religions in some sense. Not that they're all equally true, but he, I feel like I, I have to go, I should go back and actually watch it, because I do feel like he said, like, oh, you know, um, for me, Orthodox Christianity is how I experience God, and I'm like, okay, I mean, but like, but you believe it's the truth, though, like, it's not just like, uh, it's not just like a TV channel you put on, I'm gonna watch the Orthodox Christian view of the world today, like, I do think, you know, I guess like you, you, you pretty much got it right down to the to the bone. There, it is like a soft perennialism, and I guess maybe like in a sense, like personally, like I don't even know if I would call it perennialism. Like I think that like no religion is completely wrong. They're gonna get things right. Yeah. So is all different philosophies, but they're, they're complete in Orthodox Christianity is the view I would take. Um, and I would I would ex- I would extend that to even atheists. Like even atheists can say true things about the world, but. Like they, like, you know, they're ninety percent wrong and ten percent right. They would be a hundred percent right if they were Christian. So, um, it is interesting. Now, yeah, Dugan is also interesting because, like you just mentioned, like he has had like this very uh, diverse. I hate to use the word, but like I don't know how else to describe it. It's very diverse, like character development, ideologically. Yes. Um, like you, like you just mentioned before, he was part of that, like. Um, proto Satanist organization or whatever, but then he's also, um, what, what was it? The National Bolsheviks at one point, yeah. right? That was, and then now he's more of like this uh, fourth positionist. Um, so it's it's an interesting kind of thing to look at. Now, when I first started getting into this stuff, I used to buy into this like Eurasian anti-Western. Uh, I don't want to say narrative, but I guess you could just call it like ideology. But then I kind of, like when it comes to materialism being a Western phenomenon, uh, it's very prevalent in the West, that's for sure. But like, I don't think the East is uh, completely immune from it. I mean, you had communist regimes in the East for a very long time. And, you know, Marxism, is, they, they, their, their metaphysical worldview is dialectical materialism. Um, Maoist China if I'm not mistaken, it's pretty similar. It, and it's, it's probably, you know, it's probably like a heretical form of materialism or whatever. But, um, trying to understand Russia now, it's very hard. Because it, it has like all like, it's almost like Russia has like a bunch of influences from all points of its history and it's like combined mm-hmm. into one. And you have people who try and focus on one only and ignore the other ones. Oh, Russia's a traditional Orthodox nation. Oh no, Russia's actually, as Haas would say, you know, uh, a secret mega communist, you know, uh, society <laughs> yeah. in the making. So it's like, it's very hard to really pin pinpoint it down. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I was getting off track here for a second. Um, but, uh, 
Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. What, what was your you're question? About the Eura- you, oh, we're, you're talk- we were talking about the Eurasianism and how you were kind of with it, but then now you're against it. Yeah. I'm, uh, I mean, I understand the point of view of the Eurasian idea. Uh, I think, you know, because Dugan has this idea of like uh, civilizational design, which is an idea I really like. I think it, it is yes. really true. Yes. Um, and he talks about how like Russian, you know, he's got that famous line, we have our own Russian truth or whatever in that interview. Now, people probably misinterpreted what he meant by that. Like, I don't think he's literally saying what we want to be true is true, but he means like our understanding of the truth truth is going to be different from the understanding of the truth in England or whatever. I, I mean, I think, think it's just know, a basic, like, um, I think it's just like a basic like, phenomenological point, right? It's like, you know, you could yeah. say that there is a quote unquote objective world out there. I'm fine saying that. However, we can't we can't access that world objectively from a sort of God's eye point of view. We can only access it from our you know subjective finitude. So therefore, whatever way we view the world is going to be interpreted through our own you know subjectivity. I don't think that's a controversial point to make. Correct, and I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, that's really it's. I mean, it's something that Kant would say in a way um, that you know like you, we don't know the thing in it in itself. We can only know it through our own like subjective apparatus right uh so yeah I, I would agree with dugan on that i mean he's right that like materialism has a very rich history in the west like england you have like um empiricism the epistemology of empiricism and you know david hume and uh i mean you know england is pretty well known for that but a lot of people forget you know there's there was a whole school of english platonists and english idealists yeah. Now they didn't. They didn't really, you know, take the. They didn't get the big win like the empiricists did. But well, that's mostly exist. because of World War One and Bertrand Russell. Yeah, exactly. Right. There was like that. You know, I've heard this idea, and I, I do believe it. That like, um, it was a lot of anti-Germanism that caused, yes. you know, this rejection of idealism because oh, that's like a dirty German philosophy or whatever. We don't want to be like them. Um. And then also a lot of the big idealists in England, like during this time, and especially when Bertrand Russell was writing, you know, these very, like, frankly, these very silly arguments against idealism. They were very kind of like, they basically just accused them of solipsism when that's very obviously that that's not what they're about. Um, like all the big names, like a big tagger. Um, and I forget the other guy. Like, like they basically just like, they, you know, just died during that time period. So, you know, you had the culture against them, you had Bertrand Russell against them, and then all the, you know, big proponents who could have defended it just kind of, you know, passed away. Yeah, I think maybe you're thinking of F.H. Bradley. Yeah, uh, Bradley, yeah. Yeah, he, he's another. I mean, and even Italy had their own idealist school, right? Everybody knows Giovanni Gentile. Um, but yes, like, I think and, and, Dugan, and just real quick know, on that, um, just real quick on that, um, you know, Julius Savola, his first book uh, was actually called Magical Idealism or something like that, where it was basically him trying to make, is this very, like, academic book, which he basically tries to argue for his own sort of branch of idealism that he calls magical idealism. That is, yeah. I, is that still untranslated? I think somebody was working on. Um, I think it's translated, or maybe I okay. might be wrong. But there's another book that's. I think he wrote a book on phenomenology that's getting translated. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, but um, yeah. So back to the Eurasian thing. Like, so yeah, Dugan has he's he is right about that. Um, in some sense, and I will give credit to him there. But I do think you know. If we look objectively for for a moment here at Russian culture, and you look at the history of Russia, um, the Russian people are an Indo-European people. They share a language, they share a a literal like racial material component with the rest of Europe, and then their culture is an extension of you know European culture. So I think they have more in common with Europeans than they do with um, actual like East Asian peoples. Now, from a geopolitical perspective. They've allied. I think they're they're probably more allied because of um, ideological commitments. Because if you look at Russia, I mean, Russia was at war with Japan during the time of Tsar Nicholas, and all like so they were at war with other countries in the East. Um, so I do think like and I, you know obviously like when it comes to culture and ethnicity, like the, the line like it is a spectrum, so to speak, like because it is all over the world, right? It's going to blur out when, once you get to certain parts of the world. Um, you know, the further east you go in Russia, like you, you have like, you know, um, Asiatic peoples who speak the Russian language and 
they but they still maintain their own you know sort of like like Tuvins for example like they still know their own language but they uh they like speak Russian a lot of the time as well so I, I think like uh Russia is very it's hard to understand because in one sense it is very European the western part of Russia is very European and then it kind of merges in with like uh oriental culture in some sense but uh, I think it's more European than it, than um Asiatic but I guess from a geopolitical perspective, I understand why they would want to pursue Eurasianism. But uh, I, but I think this just... also has to do with, um, if I could, I think part of the you know understanding Dugan's view of Russia and this sort of Eurasianist thing um, has to do with his view of time, right? Because for him, he understands as like kind of like you know Saint Augustine understands kind of like time, you know, the past, present, the future. Phenomenologically speaking, they're all sort of like they all have similar. Like in fourth political theory, he says they all have similar, I think, um, phenomenological weight, right? Because the past is already gone, the present is always fleeting, and the future is not yet. So they all really have no existence. So he, he therefore uses that um, to say that the past, the present, the future all matter. So when he's thinking about Russia and what Russia is, he's not just thinking about the past. He's not just thinking about the present, but he's also, I think, incorporating the future of what, in his view, Russia ought to be and what Russia will be, you know, under his uh, viewpoint. So I think that that's also something to take into account when you look at, you know, his view of Russia not being a, uh, uh, you know, very distinct from Europe. I think the other uh, main thing as well is that I think he, the spiritual aspect is also important for him, right? Yeah. So I think he sees the uh, the Eastern Orthodoxy, or, uh, the, so the Orthodoxy of Russia, you know, even though, you know, you might say, oh, look, you know, only like, you know, you know, 2% of Russian people go to church every week or something like that. He said, okay, maybe that's true today, but in my ideal world, it's like 100% or whatever. So right. when you also take into that account, he views the Orthodox Catholic divide as also very important, which I think as an Orthodox Christian, you should. Um, so yeah. I think there's a lot more to the Eurasianism stuff. I'm not saying he's yeah, really right, I, but there's nuance. Yeah, that is a good point. Um and that would actually, like, if, if we take that divide, it would, you know, bifurcate the Europe into, you know, Western and, and Eastern. Like, even, like, the Balkans would, would fall into, I guess, like, that sort of, like, pan-Orthodox sphere, if we want to call it that. I think, um, now, like... Well, yeah, I mean, Dugan is a... Dugan, Dugan does like the Slavophiles who wanted to sort of, um, you know, orient towards, like, you know, the Slavic people and the Orthodox people rather than the West, so it's not really surprising. Right. Yeah, and, um... Now, you see, for some reason, I, I don't really know, may, maybe the Russian and Ukraine war kind of, like, accelerated this thing, but if you look at places like Twitter, if you look at just political commentary and, like, the dissident right at the moment, there's, like, this big divide in the dissident right between, like, uh, people who really like NATO and people who really like the East. Um, and so you have, like, like unironic, like, uh, like, 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 you know, oh, you know, I'm 100% pro-NATO, and then you have, like, the other, like, oh, I'm 100%, you know, pro-Russia or whatever. In my view, like, in my ideal world, because I can only speak for myself here, I would, uh, I would want, like, the end of the schism between East and West, and I, I want, like, a reunification of Christianity. I'd like to see how Europe was, like, before, um, you know, when relations with Russia were good, for the most part. Yeah. Uh, but it, it would even be more so because, you know, pr like pre schismatic would be ideal, is in my opinion. And I, and I think I think once you have that divide, kind of destroyed, you know, what, once we're all on the same page, uh, of Christianity, then you'll kind of have like this sort of pro probably more of an identification of Slavs with the rest of Europe, um, in my opinion. If that was if that were to happen. Yeah, but also within even if you read, for instance, um. What's actually my, it's kind of a deep cut of Dugan's, but it's probably my favorite work of his. Um, it's called Ethnos and Society, um, which is a pretty good book by Dugan. It's pretty short, but it's like his um, ethnosociology. Um, and in that, he always talks about how, you know, these things could change. Like these ethnoses, these peoples, they're not set in stone. Just because they've been there for a while doesn't mean they always have to be that way. There could be uh, a new ethnogenesis that takes yeah. part. So I think even within Dugan's own ideology, there's um, or his own sort of intellectual framework, there's room for these things. But I think in his view, he wants to see, uh, you know, Russia kind of reemerge as one of the a pole, like one pole in the multipolar world. And so because of that, he sort of has to, um, 
uh, he has to want to take all of the uh, what we might call the remainder of the Western civilization. So if you take the or if you take the global order and everybody who's not part of that, people who are you know rebellious to some extent, you know like Yemen, Syria, Palestine, Venezuela, China, you know, and you know some of these other countries as well. These um you know Russia of course and even India perhaps. He wants to take all of these forces and even the sort of um um. I think in Eurasian Mission, he also talks about how, you know, even ally with some of these far left and far right groups in Europe and in America, just to be this sort of reaction against the West and just to be this force against the West. That way the West can collapse and then out of that sort of chaos. So Dukin basically wants to create a bunch of chaos through taking all these remainders, these people who have been, who felt that they have gotten the short end of the stick of, you know, Western hegemony and then use that to destroy the West. And that way Russia can emerge as you know a regional power or you know one pole in the multipolar world so thank you so much gabriel for coming on do you want to tell us a little bit about your channel and anything new any videos you have etc etc where people can reach you yeah so um currently in the works i'm working on um a video uh, i'm going over a lot of the videos i do are like basically analyzing books and simplifying them so one of the the videos i have coming up is uh, capitalism uh socialism and democracy by joseph schumpeter it's going to be a while before that comes out it's a very long book it's a very long book and uh if you would like to reach me you could reach me at uh gabriel sprock at gmail.com i should have had that up on my channel i don't know if it's there but that is my email if anybody wants to has questions or wants to do an interview or whatever and you could also reach me at my instagram page when i'm posting I don't really use it anymore, and I don't post on there, but I am active if you ever need to message me or something. All right, sounds good. Well, Gabriel, thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. I'd be happy to come on any other time and collab in the future.